They said nothing on their way back to the firehouse. Nobody looked at anyone else. Montag sat in the front seat with Beatty and Black. They did not even smoke their pipes. They sat there looking out the front of the great salamander as they turned a corner and went silently on. Master Ridley, said Montag at last. What? said Beatty. She said, Master Ridley. She said some crazy thing when we came in the door. Play the man, she said, Master Ridley. Something, something, something. We shall this day light such a candle, by God's grace, in England, as I trust shall never be put out, said Beatty. Stoneman glanced over at the captain, as did Montag, startled. Beatty rubbed his chin. A man named Latimer said that to a man named Nicholas Ridley as they were being burnt alive at Oxford for heresy on October 16, 1555. Montag and Stoneman went back to looking at the street as it moved under the engine wheels. I'm full of bits and pieces, said Beatty. Most fire captains have to be. Sometimes I surprise myself. Watch it, Stoneman. Stoneman braked the truck. Damn, said Beatty. You've gone right by the corner where we turn for the firehouse. Who is it? Who would it be, said Montag, leaning back against the closed door in the dark. His wife said at last, Well, put on the light. I don't want the light. Come to bed. He heard her roll impatiently. The bed springs squealed. Are you drunk? she said. So it was the hand that started it all. He felt one hand and then the other work his coat free and let it slump to the floor. He held his pants out into an abyss and let them fall into darkness. His hands had been infected and soon it would be his arms. He could feel the poison working up his wrists and into his elbows and his shoulders, and then the jump over from shoulder blade to shoulder blade like a spark leaping a gap. His hands were ravenous, and his eyes were beginning to feel hunger as if they must look at something, anything, everything. His wife said, What are you doing? He balanced in space with the book in his sweating, cold fingers. A minute later she said, just don't stand there in the middle of the floor. He made a small sound. What? she asked. He made more soft sounds. He stumbled toward the bed and shoved the book clumsily under the cold pillow. He fell into bed and his wife cried out, startled. He lay far across the room from her on a winter island separated by an empty sea. She talked to him for what seemed a long while, and she talked about this, and she talked about that, and it was only words, like the words he had heard once in a nursery at a friend's house, a two-year-old child building word patterns, talking jargon, making pretty sounds in the air. But Montag said nothing, and after a long while, when he only made the small sounds, he felt her move in the room and come to his bed and stand over him and put her hand down to feel his cheek. He knew that when she pulled her hand away from his face, it was wet. Late in the night he looked over at Mildred. She was awake. There was a tiny dance of melody in the air. Her seashell was tamped in her ear again, and she was listening to far people in far places, her eyes wide and staring at the fathoms of blackness above her in the ceiling. Wasn't there an old joke about the wife who talked so much on the telephone that her desperate husband ran out to the nearest store and telephoned her to ask what was for dinner? Well, then why didn't he buy himself an audio seashell broadcasting station and talk to his wife late at night, murmur, whisper, shout, scream, yell? But what would he whisper? What would he yell? What could he say? and suddenly she was so strange he couldn't believe he knew her at all. He was in someone else's house, like those other jokes people told of the gentleman, drunk, coming home late, late at night, unlocking the wrong door, entering a wrong room, and bedding with a stranger, and getting up early and going to work, and neither of them the wiser. Millie, he whispered. 
What? I didn't mean to startle you. What I want to know is... Well? When did we meet? And where? When did we meet for what? She asked. I mean, originally. He knew she must be frowning in the dark. He clarified it. The first time we ever met, where was it? And when? Why, it was it. She stopped. I don't know, she said. He was cold. Can't you remember? It's been so long. Only ten years, that's all, only ten. Don't get excited, I'm trying to think. She laughed an odd little laugh that went up and up. Funny. How funny not to remember where or when you met your husband or wife. He lay massaging his eyes, his brow and the back of his neck, slowly. He held both hands over his eyes and applied a steady pressure there as if to crush memory into place. It was suddenly more important than any other thing in a lifetime that he know where he had met Mildred. It doesn't matter. She was up in the bathroom now, and he heard the water running and the swallowing sound she made. No, I guess not, he said. He tried to count how many times she swallowed, and he thought of the visit from the two zinc-oxide-faced men with the cigarettes in their straight-lined mouths and the electronic-eyed snake winding down into the layer upon layer of night and stone and stagnant spring water, and he wanted to call out to her, How many have you taken tonight? The capsules. How many will you take later and not know? And so on every hour. Or maybe not tonight, tomorrow night. And me not sleeping tonight or tomorrow night or any night for a long while now that this has started. And he thought of her lying on the bed with the two technicians standing straight over her, not bent with concern, but only standing straight, arms folded. And he remembered thinking then that if she died, he was certain he wouldn't cry. For it would be the dying of an unknown, a street face, a newspaper image. And it was suddenly so very wrong that he had begun to cry, not at death, but at the thought of not crying at death. A silly, empty man near a silly, empty woman, while the hungry snake made her still more empty. How do you get so empty, he wondered. Who takes it out of you? And that awful flower the other day, the dandelion... It had summed up everything, hadn't it? What a shame. You're not in love with anyone. And why not? Well, wasn't there a wall between him and Mildred when you came down to it? Literally not just one wall, but so far three. And expensive, too. And the uncles, the aunts, the cousins, the nieces, the nephews that lived in those walls... The gibbering pack of tree apes that said nothing, 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 and said it loud, loud, loud. He had taken to calling them relatives from the very first. How's Uncle Lewis today? Who? And Aunt Maud. The most significant memory he had of Mildred, really, was of a little girl in a forest without trees. How odd. Or rather, a little girl lost on a plateau where there used to be trees. You could feel the memory of their shapes all about, sitting in the center of the living room. The living room. What a good job of labeling that was now. No matter when he came in, the walls were always talking to Mildred. Something must be done. Yes, something must be done. Well, let's not stand and talk. Let's do it. I'm so mad I could spit. What was it all about? Mildred couldn't say. Who was mad at whom? Mildred didn't quite know. What were they going to do? Well, said Mildred, wait around and see. He had waited around to see. A great thunderstorm of sound gushed from the walls. Music bombarded him at such an immense volume that his bones were almost shaken from their tendons. He felt his jaw vibrate, his eyes wobble in his head. He was a victim of concussion. When it was all over, he felt like a man who had been thrown from a cliff, whirled in a centrifuge, and spat out over a waterfall that fell and fell into emptiness and emptiness, and never quite touched bottom, never 
never quite, no, not quite, touched bottom. And you fell so fast you didn't touch the sides either, never quite touched anything. The thunder faded. The music died. There, said Mildred. And it was indeed remarkable. Something had happened. Even though the people in the walls of the room had barely moved and nothing had really been settled, you had the impression that someone had turned on a washing machine or sucked you up in a gigantic vacuum. You drowned in music and pure cacophony. He came out of the room sweating and on the point of collapse. Behind him, Mildred sat in her chair and the voice went on again. Well, everything will be all right now, said an aunt. Oh, don't be too sure, said a cousin. Now don't get angry. Who's angry? You are. I am? You're mad. Why would I be mad? Because. That's all very well, cried Montag. But what are they mad about? Who are these people? Who's that man and who's that woman? Are they husband and wife? Are they divorced? Engaged? What? Good God, nothing's connected up. They, said Mildred, well, they, they had this fight, you see. They certainly fight a lot. You should listen. I think they're married. Yes, they're married. Why? And if it was not the three walls, soon to be four walls, and the dream complete, then it was the open car, and Mildred driving a hundred miles an hour across town, he shouting at her and she shouting back, and both trying to hear what was said, but hearing only the scream of the car. At least keep it down to the minimum, he yelled. What? she cried. Keep it down to fifty-five, the minimum, he shouted. The what? she shrieked. Speed, he shouted, and she pushed it up to one hundred and five miles an hour and tore the breath from his mouth. When they stepped out of the car, she had the seashells stuffed in her ears. Silence, only the wind blowing softly. Mildred, he stirred in bed. He reached over and pulled the tiny musical insect out of her ear. Mildred, Mildred? Yes. Her voice was faint. He felt he was one of the creatures electronically inserted between the slots of the phonocolor walls, speaking, but the speech not piercing the crystal barrier. He could only pantomime, hoping she would turn his way and see him. They would not touch through the glass. Mildred, do you know that girl I was telling you about? What girl? She was almost asleep. The girl next door. What girl next door? You know, the high school girl. Clarice, her name is. Oh, yes, said his wife. I haven't seen her for a few days. Four days, to be exact. Have you seen her? No. I've meant to talk to you about her. Strange. Oh, I know the one you mean. I thought you would. Her said Mildred in the dark room. What about her? asked Montag. I meant to tell you. Forgot. Forgot. Tell me now. What is it? I think she's gone. Gone? Whole family moved out somewhere. But she's gone for good. I think she's dead. We couldn't be talking about the same girl. No, the same girl. McClellan? McClellan. Run over by a car. Four days ago. I'm not sure. But I think she's dead. The family moved out anyway. I don't know. But I think she's dead. You're not sure of it? No, not sure. Pretty sure. Why didn't you tell me sooner? Forgot. Four days ago. I forgot all about it. Four days ago, he said quietly, lying there. They lay there in the dark room, not moving, either of them. Good night, she said. 
he heard a faint rustle. Her hand moved. The electric thimble moved like a praying mantis on the pillow, touched by her hand. Now it was in her ear again, humming. He listened, and his wife was singing under her breath. Outside the house, a shadow moved. An autumn wind rose up and faded away. But there was something else in the silence that he heard. It was like a breath exhaled upon the window. It was like a faint drift of greenish, luminescent smoke, the motion of a single huge October leaf blowing across the lawn and away. The hound, he thought. It's out there tonight. It's out there now. If I opened the window... He did not open the window. He had chills and fever in the morning. You can't be sick, said Mildred. He closed his eyes over the hotness. Yes. But you were all right last night. No, I wasn't all right. He heard the relatives shouting in the parlor. Mildred stood over his bed curiously. He felt her there. He saw her without opening his eyes, her hair burnt by chemicals to a brittle straw, her eyes with a kind of cataract, unseen but suspect far behind the pupils, the reddened, pouting lips, the body as thin as a praying mantis from dieting, and her flesh like white bacon. He could remember her no other way. Will you bring me aspirin and water? You've got to get up, she said. It's noon. You've slept five hours later than usual. Will you turn the parlor off? he asked. That's my family. Will you turn it off for a sick man? I'll turn it down. She went out of the room and did nothing to the parlor and came back. Is that better? Thanks. That's my favorite program, she said. What about the aspirin? You've never been sick before. She went away again. Well, I'm sick now. I'm not going to work tonight. Call Beatty for me. You acted funny last night. She returned, humming. Where's the aspirin? He glanced at the water glass she handed him. Oh. She walked to the bath again. Did something happen? A fire is all. I had a nice evening, she said in the bathroom. What doing? The parlor. What was on? Programs. What programs? Some of the best ever. Who? Oh, you know, the bunch. Yes, the bunch, the bunch, the bunch. He pressed at the pain in his eyes and suddenly the odor of kerosene made him vomit. Mildred came in humming. She was surprised. Why'd you do that? He looked with dismay at the floor. We burnt an old woman with her books. It's a good thing the rug's washable. She fetched a mop and worked on it. I went to Helen's last night. Couldn't you get the shows in your own parlor? Sure, but it's nice visiting. She went out into the parlor. He heard her singing. Mildred, he called. She returned, singing, snapping her fingers softly. Aren't you going to ask me about last night? he said. What about it? We burnt a thousand books. We burnt a woman. Well? The parlor was exploding with sound. We burnt copies of Dante and Swift and Marcus Aurelius. Wasn't he a European? Something like that. Wasn't he a radical? I never read him. He was a radical. Mildred fiddled with the telephone. You don't expect me to call Captain Beatty, do you? You must. Don't shout. I wasn't shouting. He was up in bed suddenly, enraged and flushed, shaking. The parlor roared in the hot air. I can't call him. I can't tell him I'm sick. Why? Because you're afraid, he thought. A child feigning illness, afraid to call because after a moment's discussion the conversation would run so. 
Yes, Captain, I feel better already. I'll be in at ten o'clock tonight. You're not sick, said Mildred. Montag fell back in bed. He reached under his pillow. The hidden book was still there. Mildred? How would it be if... Well, maybe I quit my job a while. You want to give up everything? After all these years of working, because one night some woman and her books? You should have seen her, Millie. She's nothing to me. She shouldn't have had books. It was her responsibility. She should have thought of that. I hate her. She's got you going, and next thing you know, we'll be out. No house, no job, nothing. You weren't there. You didn't see, he said. There must be something in books. Things we can't imagine to make a woman stay in a burning house. There must be something there. You don't stay for nothing. She was simple-minded. She was as rational as you and I, more so perhaps, and we burnt her. That's water under the bridge. No, not water. Fire. You ever seen a burnt house? It smolders for days. Well, this fire will last me the rest of my life. God, I've been trying to put it out in my mind all night. I'm crazy with trying. You should have thought of that before becoming a fireman. Thought, he said. Was I given a choice? My grandfather and father were firemen. In my sleep, I ran after them. The parlor was playing a dance tune. This is the day you go on the early shift, said Mildred. You should have gone two hours ago. I just noticed. It's not just the woman that died, said Montag. Last night I thought about all the kerosene I've used in the past ten years. And I thought about books. And for the first time I realized that a man was behind each one of the books. A man had to think them up. A man had to take a long time to put them down on paper. And I'd never even thought that thought before. He got out of bed. It took some man a lifetime, maybe, to put some of his thoughts down, looking around at the world and life, and then I come along in two minutes and boom, it's all over. Let me alone, said Mildred. I didn't do anything. Let you alone? Well, that's all very well, but how can I leave myself alone? We need not to be let alone. We need to be really bothered once in a while. How long is it? since you were really bothered. About something important, about something real. And then he shut up, for he remembered last week and the two white stones staring up at the ceiling and the pump snake with the probing eye and the two soap-faced men with the cigarettes moving in their mouths when they talked. But that was another Mildred. That was a Mildred so deep inside this one and so bothered, really bothered, that the two women had never met. He turned away. Mildred said, Well, now you've done it. Out front of the house. Look who's here. I don't care. There's a Phoenix car just drove up and a man in a black shirt with an orange snake stitched on his arm coming up the front walk. Captain Beatty, he said. Captain Beatty. Montag did not move, but stood looking into the cold whiteness of the wall immediately before him. Go let him in, will you? Tell him I'm sick. Tell him yourself. She ran a few steps this way, a few steps that, and stopped, eyes wide, when the front door speaker called her name softly, softly, Mrs. Montag. Mrs. Montag, someone here. Someone here, Mrs. Montag. Mrs. Montag, someone's here. Fading. Montag made sure the book was well hidden behind the pillow, climbed slowly back into bed, arranged the covers over his knees and across his chest, half sitting, and after a while Mildred moved and went out of the room and Captain Beatty strolled in, his hands in his pockets. Shut the relatives up, said Beatty, looking around at everything except Montag and his wife. This time, Mildred ran. The yammering voices stopped yelling in the parlor. 
Captain Beatty sat down in the most comfortable chair with a peaceful look on his ruddy face. He took time to prepare and light his brass pipe and puff out a great smoke cloud. Just thought I'd come by and see how the sick man is. How'd you guess? Beatty smiled his smile, which showed the candy pinkness of his gums and the tiny candy whiteness of his teeth. I've seen it all. You were going to call for a night off. Montag sat in bed. Well, said Beatty, take the night off. He examined his eternal matchbox, the lid of which said guaranteed one million lights in this igniter, and began to strike the chemical match abstractedly. Blow out, strike, blow out, strike, speak a few words, blow out. He looked at the flame. He blew. He looked at the smoke. When will you be well? Tomorrow. The next day, maybe. First of the week. Beatty puffed his pipe. Every fireman, sooner or later, hits this. They only need understanding to know how the wheels run. Need to know the history of our profession. They don't feed it to rookies like they used to. Damn shame. Puff. Only fire chiefs remember it now. Puff. I'll let you in on it. Mildred fidgeted. Beatty took a full minute to settle himself in and think back for what he wanted to say. When did it all start, you ask, this job of ours? How did it come about? Where? When? Well, I'd say it really got started around about a thing called the Civil War. Even though our rule book claims it was founded earlier. The fact is we didn't get along well until photography came into its own. Then, motion pictures in the early 20th century. Radio. Television. Things began to have mass. Montag sat in bed, not moving. And because they had mass, they became simpler, said Beatty. Once, books appealed to a few people here, there, everywhere. They could afford to be different. The world was roomy. But then the world got full of eyes and elbows and mouths. Double, triple, quadruple population. Films and radios, magazines, books leveled down to a sort of paste-putting norm. Do you follow me? I think so. Beatty peered at the smoke pattern he had put out on the air. Picture it. Nineteenth-century man with his horses, dogs, carts, slow motion. Then in the twentieth century, speed up your camera. Books cut shorter. Condensations, digests, tabloids... Everything boils down to the gag, the snap ending. Snap ending, Mildred nodded. Classics cut to fit 15-minute radio shows, then cut again to fill a two-minute book column, winding up at last as a 10- or 12-line dictionary resume. I exaggerate, of course. The dictionaries were for reference. But many were those whose sole knowledge of Hamlet. You know the title, certainly, Montag. It is probably only a faint rumor of a title to you, Mrs. Montag, whose sole knowledge, as I say, of Hamlet was a one-page digest in a book that claimed, Now at last you can read all the classics. Keep up with your neighbors. Do you see? Out of the nursery, into the college, and back to the nursery. There's your intellectual pattern for the past five centuries or more. Mildred rose and began to move around the room, picking things up and putting them down. Beatty ignored her and continued. Speed up the film, Montag, quick. Click, pick, look, I, now, flick, here, there, swift, pace, up, down, in, out, why, how, who, what, where, eh? Uh, bang, smack, wallop, bing, bong, boom. Digest, digests, digest, digest, digests. Politics? One column, two sentences, a headline. Then in midair, all vanishes. Whirl man's mind around about so fast under the pumping hands of publishers, exploiters, broadcasters that the centrifuge flings off all unnecessary, time-wasting thought. 
Mildred smoothed the bedclothes. Montag felt his heart jump and jump again as she patted his pillow. Right now she was pulling at his shoulder to try to get him to move so she could take the pillow out and fix it nicely and put it back. Then perhaps cry out and stare or simply reach down her hand and say, What's this? And hold up the hidden book with touching innocence. The Bible. School is shortened. Discipline relaxed. Philosophies, histories, languages dropped. English and spelling gradually, gradually neglected. Finally, almost completely ignored. That's why we're here. To protect you and to keep you safe and happy. Understood? Yes, sir! Life is immediate. The job counts. Pleasure lies all about after work. Why learn anything save pressing buttons, pulling switches, fitting nuts and bolts? Let me fix your pillow, said Mildred. No, whispered Montag. The zipper displaces the button, and a man lacks just that much time to think while dressing at dawn. A philosophical hour, and thus a melancholy hour. Mildred said, Here. Get away, said Montag. Life becomes one big pratfall, Montag. Everything bang, buff, and wow. Wow, said Mildred, yanking at the pillow. For God's sake, let me be, cried Montag passionately. Beatty opened his eyes wide. Mildred's hand had frozen behind the pillow. Her fingers were tracing the book's outline, and as the shape became familiar, her face looked surprised and then stunned. Her mouth opened to ask a question. Empty the theaters, save for clowns, and furnish the rooms with glass walls and pretty colors running up and down the walls like confetti or blood or sherry or sautern. You like baseball, don't you, Montag? Baseball's a fine game. Now Beatty was almost invisible, a voice somewhere behind a screen of smoke. What's this? asked Mildred, almost with delight. Montag heaved back against her arms. What's this here? Sit down, Montag shouted. She jumped away, her hands empty. We're talking. Beatty went on as if nothing had happened. You like bowling, don't you, Montag? Bowling, yes. And golf? Golf is a fine game. Basketball? A fine game. Billiards? Pool? Football? Fine games, all of them. More sports for everyone. Group spirit. Fun, and you don't have to think, eh? Organize and organize and super organize. Super, super sports. More cartoons in books. More pictures. The mind drinks less and less. Impatience. Highways full of crowds going somewhere, 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 nowhere. The gasoline refugee. Towns turn into motels, people in nomadic surges from place to place, following the moon tides, living tonight in the room where you slept this noon and I the night before. Mildred went out of the room and slammed the door. The parlor aunts began to laugh at the parlor uncles. Now let's take up the minorities in our civilization, shall we? Bigger the population, the more minorities. Don't step on the toes of the dog lovers, the cat lovers, doctors, lawyers, merchants, chiefs, Mormons, Baptists, Unitarians, second-generation Chinese, Swedes, Italians, Germans, Texans, Brooklynites, Irishmen, people from Oregon or Mexico. The people in this book, this play, this TV serial are not meant to represent any actual painters, cartographers, mechanics, anywhere. The bigger your market, Montag, the less you handle controversy. Remember that. All the minor, minor minorities with their navels to be kept clean. Authors full of evil thoughts lock up your typewriters. They did. Magazines became a nice blend of vanilla tapioca. Books, so the damned snobbish critics said, were dishwater. No wonder books stopped selling, the critics said. But the public, knowing what it wanted, spinning happily, let the comic books survive. And the three-dimensional sex magazines, of course. There you have it, Montag. 
It didn't come from the government down. There was no dictum, no declaration, no censorship to start with, no. Technology, mass exploitation, and minority pressure carried the trick, thank God. Today, thanks to them, you can stay happy all the time. You are allowed to read comics, the good old confessions, or trade journals. Yes, but what about the firemen, then? asked Montag. Ah, Beatty leaned forward in the faint mist of smoke from his pipe. What more easily explained than natural? With school turning out more runners, jumpers, racers, tinkerers, grabbers, snatchers, flyers, and swimmers, instead of examiners, critics, knowers, and imaginative creators, the word intellectual, of course, became the swear word it deserved to be. You always dread the unfamiliar. Surely you remember the boy in your own school class who was exceptionally bright, did most of the reciting and answering while the others sat like so many leaden idols, hating him? And wasn't it this bright boy you selected for beatings and tortures after hours? Of course it was. We must all be alike. Not everyone born free and equal, as the Constitution says, but everyone made equal. Each man the image of every other. Then all are happy, for there are no mountains to make them cower, to judge themselves against. So, a book is a loaded gun in the house next door. Burn it. Take the shot from the weapon. Breach man's mind. Who knows what might be the target of the well-read man? Me? I won't stomach them for a minute. And so, when houses were finally fireproofed completely all over the world, you were correct in your assumption the other night, there was no longer need of firemen for the old purposes. They were given the new job, as custodians of our peace of mind, the focus of our understandable and rightful dread of being inferior. Official censors, judges, and executors. That's you, Montag. And that's me. The door to the parlor opened and Mildred stood there looking in at them, looking at Beatty and then at Montag. Behind her, the walls of the room were flooded with green and yellow and orange fireworks sizzling and bursting to some music composed almost completely of trap drums, tom-toms, and cymbals. Her mouth moved and she was saying something, but the sound covered it. Beatty knocked his pipe into the palm of his pink hand, studied the ashes as if they were a symbol to be diagnosed, and searched for meaning. You must understand that our civilization is so vast that we can't have our minorities upset and stirred. Ask yourself, what do we want in this country above all? People want to be happy. Isn't that right? Haven't you heard it all your life? I want to be happy, people say. Well, aren't they? Don't we keep them moving? Don't we give them fun? That's all we live for, isn't it? For pleasure? For titillation? And you must admit our culture provides plenty of these. Yes. Montag could lip-read what Mildred was saying in the doorway. He tried not to look at her mouth, because then Beatty might turn and read what was there, too. Colored people don't like little black Sambo. Burn it. White people don't feel good about Uncle Tom's cabin. Burn it. Someone's written a book on tobacco and cancer of the lungs? The cigarette people are weeping? Burn the book. Serenity, Montag. Peace, Montag. Take your fight outside, better yet, into the incinerator. Funerals are unhappy and pagan, eliminate them too. Five minutes after a person is dead, he's on his way to the big flu, the incinerators serviced by helicopters all over the country. Ten minutes after death, a man's a speck of black dust. Let's not quibble over individuals with memoriams. Forget them. Burn all, burn everything, 
fire is bright and fire is clean. The fireworks died in the parlor behind Mildred. She had stopped talking at the same time. A miraculous coincidence. Montag held his breath. There was a girl next door, he said slowly. She's gone now, I think. Dead. I can't even remember her face. But she was different. How... How did she happen? Beatty smiled. Here or there, that's bound to occur. Clarice McClellan. We've a record on her family. We've watched them carefully. Heredity and environment are funny things. You can't rid yourselves of all the odd ducks in just a few years. The home environment can undo a lot you try to do at school. That's why we've lowered the kindergarten age year after year until now we're almost snatching them from the cradle. We had some false alarms on the McClellans when they lived in Chicago. Never found a book. Uncle had a mixed record, antisocial. The girl? She was a time bomb. The family had been feeding her subconscious, I'm sure, from what I saw of her school record. She didn't want to know how a thing was done, but why. That can be embarrassing. You ask why to a lot of things and you wind up very unhappy indeed if you keep at it. The poor girl's better off dead. Yes, dead. Luckily, queer ones like her don't happen often. We know how to nip most of them in the bud early. You can't build a house without nails and wood. If you don't want a house built, hide the nails and wood. If you don't want a man unhappy politically, don't give him two sides to a question to worry him. Give him one. Better yet, give him none. Let him forget there is such a thing as war. If the government is inefficient, top-heavy and tax-mad, better it be all those than that people worry over it. Peace, Montag. Give the people contests they win by remembering the words to more popular songs or the names of state capitals or how much corn Iowa grew last year. Cram them full of non-combustible data. Chalk them so damn full of facts they feel stuffed but absolutely brilliant with information. Then they'll feel their thinking. They'll get a sense of motion without moving. And they'll be happy because facts of that sort don't change. Don't give them any slippery stuff like philosophy or sociology to tie things up with. That way lies melancholy. Any man who can take a TV wall apart and put it back together again, and most men can nowadays, is happier than any man who tries to slide rule, measure, and equate the universe, which just won't be measured or equated without making man feel bestial and lonely. I know. I've tried it. To hell with it. So bring on your clubs and parties, your acrobats and magicians, your daredevils, jet cars, motorcycle helicopters, your sex and heroin, more of everything to do with automatic reflex. If the drama is bad, if the film says nothing, if the play is hollow, sting me with the theremin loudly. I'll think I'm responding to the play when it's only a tactile reaction to vibration. But I don't care. I just like solid entertainment. Beatty got up. I must be going. Lecture's over. I hope I've clarified things. The important thing for you to remember, Montag, is we're the happiness boys, the Dixie duo, you and I and the others. We stand against the small tide of those who want to make everyone unhappy with conflicting theory and thought. We have our fingers in the dike. Hold steady. Don't let the torrent of melancholy and drear philosophy drown our world. We depend on you. I don't think you realize how important you are. We are to our happy world as it stands now. 
Beatty shook Montag's limp hand. Montag still sat as if the house were collapsing about him and he could not move in the bed. Mildred had vanished from the door. One last thing, said Beatty. At least once in his career, every fireman gets an itch. What do the books say, he wonders. Oh, to scratch that itch, eh? Well, Montag, take my word for it. I've had to read a few in my time to know what I was about, and the books say nothing. Nothing you can teach or believe. They are about non-existent people, figments of imagination, if they're fiction. And if they're non-fiction, it's worse. One professor calling another an idiot, one philosopher screaming down another's gullet. All of them running about, putting out the stars and extinguishing the sun. You come away lost. Well, then, what if a fireman, accidentally, really not intending anything, takes a book home with him? Montag twitched. The open door looked at him with its great vacant eye. A natural error. Curiosity alone, said Beatty. We don't get over-anxious or mad. We let the fireman keep the book twenty-four hours. If he hasn't burned it by then, we simply come burn it for him. Of course. Montag's mouth was dry. Well, Montag, will you take another later shift today? Will we see you tonight, perhaps? I don't know, said Montag. What? Beatty looked faintly surprised. Montag shut his eyes. I'll be in later. Maybe. We'd certainly miss you if you didn't show, said Beatty, putting his pipe in his pocket thoughtfully. I'll never come in again, thought Montag. Get well and keep well, said Beatty. He turned and went out through the open door.